Hello, this is Nancy Jutton. I'm the Get Known to Get Paid Mentor and the host of the Learn More, Earn More YouTube channel. And today I am very, very excited to talk about something that is incredibly relevant, especially if you are a financial rep or an advisor who wants to make more money, have time for your life, and also have a business that runs by itself. These are the kinds of outcomes that a lot of people dream about, but sometimes often feel just beyond their reach. And today we're actually bringing in an expert who can talk to you about how that can all be your reality sooner versus later. And I can't wait for you to meet Andrea Bullard. Let me tell you a little bit about Andrea. Andrea is one of the leading business development and high performance team coaches for financial advisors and reps. She has helped hundreds of individuals grow their business to multiple six and seven figures while gaining more time freedom and peace of mind. Her newest book, Turnkey Secrets, The Ultimate Guide to Building Your Multi-Million Dollar Wealth Management Practice is an Amazon number one international bestseller. Results-driven financial reps and advisors describe her as dynamic, energetic, motivational, and educational, and her mission is to give her clients cutting-edge success tools and concepts to immediately impact and grow their businesses and their teams, no matter what the future is going to bring forward. She's a disruptor. She's got powerful ideas. Andrea, welcome to the program. Oh, Nancy, thank you for having me. I'm excited about this. I am too. So we, we know who you are and what you've accomplished, but I know you've got a story around how you discovered this work that you were going to do and it was influenced by something you saw happen with regard to your dad. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I think life is, is a little bit serendipity and sometimes, you know, we talk about destiny. Well, I'll go way back up. I grew in a, I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin and you know, that Midwest, nice life that you see in the movies. Uh, there were five kids, uh, my mom and dad, loved everything, was beautiful, graduated from college, uh, I mean, from high school, and then went to University, University of Wisconsin my freshman year. And it was March of that semester, second semester, that I remember was a dreary day, and I get a phone call. It was around five in the afternoon, it was my brother. And my brother said to me, Andrew, you have to come home. And I said, why? And he goes, because something's happened to dad. And I said, what happened? And he said he had a heart attack. And then I still remember just being silent. And I said, how is he? And he said, he's gone. Mm -hmm. And it was completely devastating to me because I loved him. I worked with him. He was just such a funny, great guy. So we went home to the funeral and I knew him just as my dad. And what happened for the next three days, Nancy, is that men stood in line, like they were out the funeral door and they were sobbing, literally sobbing. I was 18, they were sobbing on my shoulder saying, if it weren't for your dad, I wouldn't have my farm. If it weren't for your dad, I wouldn't have my business. Well, you see, my, my father was a loan officer in a bank. And so instead of foreclosing on loans, what he did, he went to the farmer on a Sunday or at night, so I remember he'd be gone every once in a while and he would work with them on their business plan. So instead of foreclosing on the loans, he worked with these people. And the most amazing thing is that the day they buried him, they closed the town down. I mean, who does that? And I remember men lining the streets and just crying. And this was my dad, I knew him as my dad. And I'm looking at what impact that he made was, was huge. But the other side of the story that's fascinating is he had a heart attack at 45. So he dropped dead, he was only 55. And all those, all the people listening to this that are financial advisors and reps, they understand what that means. When he had a major heart attack at 45, he was basically uninsurable from that point on. So what happened after he died was this. We didn't have insurance, my mom never worked. So from 18 years of age on, I didn't always like to go back to someone and say, you know, is there money? Who can support me? I was on my own. So it's interesting when you put those two factors together that I understand this industry, I understand the importance of insurance, the importance of planning, because I had to lift it. I know it's like not to have money. And I think 
his impact, what he made in the world, it's kind of serendipity that here I am coaching a financial advisors and reps because I believe so much in what they do and then also making a difference in their lives. It's just oh, it's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. You know, why we do anything that we do, there's always a powerful emotional pivot story that gives life to what it is that we do beyond how we are able to provide for our own family. This is personal to you. You totally get it. And that's probably why people feel so comfortable and so inspired and called to work directly with you because you appreciate the journey that they've been traveling and you also appreciate the outcomes that they want. So now we know why you're working with financial advisors and reps and why you're so passionate about it. So there's a lot of change happening in the industry and there's a lot of um, desire for people to find a way to change with it. Um, if, if an advisor wants to create a multi-million dollar practice, how can they do that? And how can you help them? That's such a great question. I love that question because this is when I sit with advisors, I break it down with them. I said, there's four pillars. And I said, now look at you got into this business. Most of them got into this business. They had the passion of helping people and they went through a training, whether it was through investment training or insurance training. They sat with maybe two weeks, they passed courses and basically their job, they're trained to what? To gather new clients, to bring in investment money and or to bring in insurance and do planning. So that's their training and it's years. I mean, they're brilliant. You know, whether they get their uh, CFP or CFA or series 667 life and health, they have to learn the intellectual piece of it. They have to learn about products. They have to learn how to sell. So basically they're re really learning how to build their practice, meaning their clients. But there's another piece to this. And the other piece to this, Nancy, is that if they really want why they got in this business, they I always, I always say to them, go back to that recruiter, why did you get in this business? And the recruiter said to them, would you like a life that you could have time freedom, you can spend time with your kids, unlimited income, you know, that was their dream. And they go, yes, yes, I want that, right? But a lot of them, and someone probably listening to this now say, yes, that's what I wanted, but here's where I'm at, you know, I'm running this business and, and I'm doing all this stuff and I don't have time to see people and I feel overwhelmed and everything from the technology to, you know, all the new compliance rules coming on, they just feel overwhelmed and they don't feel they can get ahead of that. But here's what they need to step away. They need to look at this differently and they need to say, I need to learn how to build a business. And in building a business, they need four pillars. And the first pillar is a vision. And I'm going to ask them all now one question that I wish someone had asked me actually years ago, but it's a great question for them to ask themselves because it gets them thinking differently. What would their life be like, Nancy, if they could build their business and they didn't have to be there if they didn't want to? Let's just think about that. That makes them hire differently. That makes them think differently. They can work with the clients they want. They can come home when they want, but Think about how they would think differently. That's a vision. That's a vision of what are you building? You know, what exactly, who's your market? Do you want a month out of the business? Do you want someone else? You know, what's your team going to like look like, which is the second pillar? And I'll make it simple. They have to have an A team. You, you can't have an A team or A business with B players. And so I'm sure some of them are thinking, well, what do you mean an A team? Well, there's the problem. You have to define that. So let's talk about that because in yeah. the green room before we got on here, you were saying to me that sometimes people come and go. There's a bit of a revolving door and that creates an, an ongoing source of frustration for the advisor or the rep because they can't ever really get a leg up because they're always having to train people that come and go. What can people do if they want to hire the right people right out of the gate? Well, again, this goes back to their business model, but I'll tell you what I view coming forward in this business, Nancy. The old model was they hired assistants. In fact, 15 years ago, when I wrote my first book, 
um, the turnkey office systems, I said to the industry, stop hiring assistants. And they said to me, Andrew, what do you mean assistance? That's what everyone does. I said, well, think about it. Do you want someone to assist you or do you want someone to run your business? And they'd say, of course, I want someone to run my business. I'd say, well, change the name. You don't want an assistant. You want an office manager. You want a director of ops. And that changed the personality of the person we're hiring. So when you talk about an A player, you have to think about many dimensions to this. And I help my clients really go into detail, everything from who do you love working with? I mean, if you want to enjoy life, you have to figure out who do you really like working with? Who do you not like working with? Get the extremes. Stop hiring the people you don't like working with, number one. Number two. So that brings me, that brings me yeah. to something I learned from um, Steve Sims of Blue Fishing. He said, he said, only hire people that pass the chug test. And his definition of the chug test is, are they capable and competent? And number three, do I want to chug a beer with them after work? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, I, that's so true. I mean, if you want a life that's amazing, you have to understand yourself first. Like, you know, like if I asked you, Nancy, who do you love working with? you could probably give me extremes. You could probably tell me who you'd really love working with, but you could probably tell me who would drive you crazy. We have to get that out of the way, right? And they have to sit down and think about that and define. So for example, a lot of them need to think, well, I like people that are going to be thinkers. I want people that are gonna take ownership of the business. All the things they want, let's start writing it down. So now when you start hiring, you know who you're looking for. But there's also another piece to that, which I think is gonna be the future. I think that the whole team needs to add value to the clients, which I believe they all need to be licensed and or have a particular expertise. That means all that expertise does not have to land on the advisor. What if I had a team of the smartest people in the industry from taxes, to let's say business planning, to let's say someone's brilliant in long-term care or retirement. If I had a think tank of brilliant people, imagine the prospects of a lineup to meet with me because now they don't have to just meet with me, the advisor. I've got a think tank of brilliant people. So skill is important. And one other thing Nancy, I'll say to, to these advisors is this. This is a key piece to it. Smart, motivated people don't stay in dead end jobs. So one thing I always have, have them ask themselves when they put the job description on who they're looking for, put the title in, I'll say, tell me the growth of this position. And if they can't answer that, here's what's gonna happen. They're gonna hire you a smart person, but they're gonna use this position as a stepping stone. So they've got to think before hiring, what's the next step? And what's interesting about that, Nancy, is that when they can say that next step, before they hire, then when they're hiring, guess what they're doing? They're really selling the dream, the journey for that potential candidate of where they can grow in their organization. So they actually attract the better candidates. I think that that's so brilliant. So brilliant. So the first pillar is vision. The yep. second is a team. That's right. No B players. What is the third pillar? Oh, the third pillar is key. And this is systems. You know, I'll go back to when I wrote my first book 15 years ago. And I'll tell you why I wrote that book. Um, it came at a time in the industry when insurance and investments started merging together. And it came at a time when technology came. It was almost like the perfect storm. So my clients remember, would say, Andrea, I can't see more people you don't understand. And I'd say, what don't I understand? They'd say, I have a thousand emails in the inbox. I don't know what to do with it, right? I have all this case prep to be done. And they always have this sea of blue files on their floor. They said, I'm overwhelmed. I, I, I just can't get things done. And I remember this guy in Boston said this to me. And I said, I just thought it was maybe disorganized. So I actually went to his office and for a couple of days, I organized it and I was done. I said, now, great. Now you're organized. This is all set. Well, two months later, Nancy, he was worse than when we started. And I thought, well, this isn't the answer. So then I read Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth. Oh, Michael that was a good one. <laughs> Isn't it? 
And he said, the best businesses in the world have the best business systems. It was like a rock fell on my head. Oh, I said, that's it. This industry has probably one of the best selling systems in the world. They meet a prospect, they take a fact finder, they go and they deliver case prep work. Maybe they deliver modifications of it. The person says, yes, they go through underwriting and or money in motion, they become a new client. No one messes with that. But think, think about that. All I say to them, well, how do you give your case notes? I don't know. When does it have to come in? I don't know. Who gets it? I don't know. What information has to go in their CRM? I don't know. I can say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So what I proceeded to do 15 years ago with the first book, I wrote systems for my clients. Everything I did was to help them get to the next level. And so the reason why I put the book, wrote the book was I got tired of saying it to them. I figured, well, they could just read the book, right? They could read the manual. And so what's happened since then to now, why I wrote the second book is technology has changed systems and I've added new systems for technology. Because you see, if an advisor hires an A team and that A team basically can take systems and plug them in, now the advisor can start stop micromanaging. Now the advisor knows exactly how their business is run. They're not worried about compliance. They're not worried about segmentation. They're everyone, it's run like a well-oiled machine. And what does that do for the advisor? It gives them time back. What does it do for the advisor? They can sleep at night. What does it do for the advisor? They can take a month vacation and not worry how their business is run. It's basically a self-running business when you get systems. Does that make sense? Yes, it sounds very exciting. You know, it, it, it does sound very exciting because I'm the thought that comes to me is like, sometimes you have to slow down before you speed up. So if people are in this overwhelm place and they come across your path, you can take them where they're at and say, okay, let's set up what, let's stop, look and listen, let's set up some systems. And then once they're set, that does open the door for a lot more life. Yeah. Well, it does. And I think that goes back to the paradigm shift of why are they overwhelmed, right? Why do they feel the bigger they get, the more things they have to do? Well, if you have systems in place, that's like an assembly line. They get done seeing people, right? The case notes are done and it's like an assembly line. It moves to the team and systems are set up. They know exactly who's doing what. They've got brilliant people and information goes from A to B to C to D until it's through. They don't have to worry. They don't but have since, to. So since you brought up this thing about case notes, I just happen to know that you have a free gift relevant to that that helps people get systematic about their case notes. Would you just tell us a little bit about that and maybe share where they can go to get that? Because I'm guessing that people are thinking, oh my gosh, we're only a few minutes into this interview and I know I want more about how to systematize. What do you have for people that are listening to this and thinking, Andrea, show me the way? Okay, I love it. Oh, I actually have two gifts. So I have a case note template, and then I also have a turnkey hiring system booklet. And they can go to andreabullard.com forward slash free and download both those documents. And so the turnkey hiring booklet will bring them through the steps on how to hire someone. Because what I found to get in A players, a lot of people do this, I always laugh, they, their great uncle, someone quits and they're like panicked. And then their great uncle Louis has a third cousin and they call them and they say, great. And they come in the next day, they like them and they say, you're hired. I know a lot of them are relating to this, right? Because great uncle Louis says they're great. So great, they're hired. And then one month later, they find out this person's smoking a lot in the back room. They can't even type. They don't know anything about it, even though they said they did. And now they have a mess and they can't fire, right? So I created this whole hiring system. How do we avoid hiring the wrong people? And equally important, how do you define the right people? So that's free, get them, because this is a mess if you don't have the right people on your team. The case note template, I'll give you, I'll give you everyone a little tip what's on this, which is huge. Everyone knows in this industry that segmenting is really important. But how most people do it is they stop the engines, they query up from their CRM, their client list, 
And then they go through and they say, oh yeah, this person's still an A. No, this person should be a B. This person should be an A. And they have to stop the engines. And, or sometimes they don't do that. And then their segmentation's a mess. So for those of you advisors listening to this, you're saying, yeah, I can relate to that, right? Segmentation should be a system. So when you do it, here's what you do it. In the case note template, after every review meeting, you are saying to your team, client John Doe is still an I client. That's right in the notes. Or you could say client John Doe is now a B client. That goes to your team. The team member gets that, that enters that information to CRM and to your client you know, tracking system. And there it is. So segmentation is, is a continual process. I'll give you one other tip. This is a big tip, I love this. What else I include in those case note templates, ready for this? These advisors are gonna love this, is we know we need to segment our clients, but why not segment your prospects? Because here's the problem. I remember years ago being in Chicago and this client of mine literally threw on this desk I was sitting at a stack of papers like this. I go, what is that? He said, those are all the prospects I'm supposed to call back today, where do I start? Seriously, because he was high activity. And so a lot of you advisors out there are thinking, yeah, that's me. I don't know where to start. I get a list of prospects. Where do I start? Okay, so here's what you do. What you do when you meet a prospect after taking a fact finder in those case notes, you say, I opened a case with prospect John Doe. He's an A prospect or he's a C prospect. So what you do now is now you can query up the A prospects first to contact back. Okay, so this is a game changer, not just for financial advisors and reps, but for anyone who is welcoming dozens or hundreds of leads during a launch or any kind of event. What do you do with all those names? It's just, a, it's a recipe for overwhelm unless you prioritize somehow how to respond. Well, that's, so let's go into another system, Nancy. We have technology today. So what you can do with all these prospects, you can put them what I call a prospect drip campaign. And so I've written over three years. So this occurs over a course of three years. Basically I have nine emails written and technology takes it over. You should put that prospect into a drip campaign with pre-done emails. And that prospect is hearing from this advisor every four months with some information, an article to stay in contact with them. This is automated with technology. Their team doesn't have to do it because I know and every advisor knows, or even you business owners, you meet people, but it's hard to keep in contact with people and query up that list, we get busy. Imagine if technology, Nancy, just takes it over. And you're right for any business owner. Well, we I've, just- I've heard that I mean, we've all heard the statistics that how many touch points are required in order for a prospect to make the decision to become a client. It doesn't always happen from cold to close. Sometimes it takes some nurturing and some romancing and some um, life circumstances to shift such that it becomes urgent at any given time. I've heard statistics that as many as or or as few as 3% of the people who are in your world are ready, eager, and willing to take an action at any given time to invest in a solution that's giving them serious discomfort. So if you have a lot of leads, only 3% of them at any given time are ready to say yes. So you got to take care of them all at some level and automating that as you're suggesting certainly is, is one way to keep in front of them so that when the timing is right, they know who to call, right? 100%. And in in this industry, Nancy, just you know, Al Granham had statistics. And so he actually, over time, researched statistics. So this is, you'll find this fascinating. So he, Al Granham said that if I give you 10 names, someone gives an advisor 10 names, out of the 10 names that they're given, five people are actually going to see them. Of the five people that actually see this advisor, three people are going to give that advisor a full fact finder. And of the three people that get that guy a full fact finder, one is going to buy. But here's the fine print. So it's stats of the game, it's sales stats, which every industry has their sales stats. But here's the fascinating part. The three to the one, one third of those people that are going to buy 
are not going to buy today. They're going to buy over the course of three years. And I've seen a similar statistic, Nancy, for all business owners. So we as business owners, if we don't keep in contact with those people that maybe we met and they were interested and we thought, wow, they're going to become our client, but they don't buy today. If we don't keep in contact with them, right, we're going to lose them. So let's say someone meets with me and they think, well, I want to, I'm interested, but not today for whatever reason. If I don't keep in contact with them over the course of three years, they may go someone else out of sight, out of mind. So if technology can keep in contact with them, with all of us, how cool is that? A system set up, I don't have to worry about it. So you guide your clients to actually set up these kinds of systems so that they can drip quality content out over time and have it be automatic. That's right. So we've covered hiring and the importance of a a player. Oh, you know what we didn't cover? We, we, the first the first pillar was vision. The second was team. The third was systems. What's the fourth pillar? Yeah, the fourth pillar to me was that invisible elephant in the room. I thought, oh, I have it. If I they've got the vision, they've got the A team systems, they've got it. It's great. The fourth pillar is leadership, and that that is really a critical pillar. If they can learn, and this is again where I really coach them and I give them strategic strategies to help them build a team, that's that's a game changer. So for example, I have what I call the Buller game plan. And so many advisors will say to me, I want my team to buy into, take ownership of the business. They don't know how to do it. So I've created from a leadership standpoint, a game plan where everyone is playing the same game. And it really, the first month I work with people, I give them this and it's a game changer. All of a sudden their team is engaged and it's just a leadership difference of how you position the goals and what's going on. And and there's a lot of things that are easy. For example, your team needs to know you care. You're, you know, if you want smart, motivated people to stay with you, they have to know the growth. So I've created Nancy, a turnkey growth plan. And I think every business owner should have that. This is my paradigm shift for every business owner. I mean, think about it. Who likes review meetings? How many advisors even know how to do review meetings for their, for their um, existing employees, right? You know, I don't know what to say. I don't know exactly how to do it. And you have to value them. Everyone gets sort of weird and the employee comes in and they hope to get a raise. But let's say the employee comes in and, and the advisor system, oh, you're not doing that good of a job and you need to improve on this and this and this and I'm not giving you a pay raise. Well, the employee leaves feeling like I'm not doing a good job and, and they, no one feels good about that. And then where does that go? So I said, it's all messed up. Let's start at the beginning of the year. So if you work for me, Nancy, I'd say, I'm going to give you a growth plan. You write it, Nancy. Tell me how you want to grow. Tell me where you want to be. Tell me what courses you're going to take. Tell me how you're going to contribute. I'm not going to tell you, you're going to tell me. Then we get the beginning of the year and I guide you and we talk about it. Doesn't, isn't that make more sense? You're like mapping your future. That is a game changer. I can see how that would be a game changer. And I can also see how that would engender more joy and enthusiasm for putting pedal to the metal to make it happen because you as the business owner appreciate where this person wants to go. And as long as there is alignment between the parties, there should be no reason why they can't all get what they want, right? It is, I'll tell you a great story. About four years ago, there, um, I actually coach staff, by the way, in my business. And why do I coach staff? Because I'm like, if we're a team, why am I just going to coach the advisor? It doesn't make sense. We're a team, let's coach everyone. And so four years ago, I had a team member here in Boston. And I remember it was November. And it was just he and his advisor. And he came up to me after and he goes, you know, I think I'm going to quit. I said, why why are you going to quit? This is crazy. And he was really bright, really talented. And he said, because I'm overwhelmed. There's too much work. Uh, I don't see any growth. I said, well, wait a minute. You've got to grow. You've got to go back. So you go back to that turnkey growth plan. I want you to go back and, and communicate this with the advisor on what you think needs to happen, what you need for you to grow, 
instead of just quitting and leaving, right? So I encouraged him, gave him words, gave him strategy. He went back and did that. Let's fast forward to where that team is today. They have around seven people on their team. They've like quadrupled their revenue. It's like gone through the roof. But this one young man who was director of ops and doing everything, right? I knew he had a bright future. This past year, and advisors will get this, he's already brought in 13 million of AUM himself. Wow. He is, and he still is a paid employee, but he did that and he's running the team. And then he's now made it where he's going to become a partner with the advisor. He's running the practice and it was a win-win. But imagine if he didn't have the opportunity to go back, if no one said to him, where do you want to grow to? What do you want to do? How can you play in this game? That would have been a lose-lose for everyone. So that's the game-changing moment that I think a lot of advisors don't understand that they have a lot of players that want to play higher, but aren't given the opportunity to, for their voice. And, and this is, again, leadership, that leadership issue. How, does, how can your team grow? How can they have a bigger opportunity? Where can they play? But the other side of that coin, what are they going to learn? What are they going to do? What are they going to add value? So it's, you know, it's really a team effort. So in your business, Yes, you have these wonderful free tools where people can learn to hire better and they also can systematize their case notes, which will help um, uh, manage their overwhelm. But you have bigger programs that you work with people on where people come under your wing to, to deploy these four pillars and so much more. If, if a financial advisor and a rep has enjoyed this conversation and felt called to chat with you further, I'm just wondering if you could just give us a little bit about maybe your flagship program. Like what is the primary way that clients tend to work with you so that these kinds of systems and outcomes can be their reality sooner versus later? So there's two ways, Nancy. The first way a lot of advisors will come on, they'll work with private coaching with me. And they basically commit to a year, but I just don't coach them, I coach their team. Now, if they're new and they wanna they're ready to hire their first person. Maybe they've hired their first person. That's great for them. That's a perfect time because now I bring the advisor in, the director of ops in, and I'm really helping them build all the systems. And so by the end of the year, their systems are humming. They're into the game. And many times their production has just skyrocketed that they end up hiring more people. So that's the private coaching. Now, once they get that going, a lot of them want what I call the prospecting concierge team. And so I created a team mastermind program where advisors and their teams join that. And the real purpose of that program is this. I'm taking team members now that, that are going to be what I call hybrid players. They may be doing underwriting. They may be doing planning. They could be doing money in motion, but they're going to be prospecting. And... Let me explain a little bit about that. I see the future of this industry and I'll make a bold statement. Um, five years ago, I remember telling advisors that paper will disappear. And I paper, clients were shaking their files at me and saying, Andrew, this file will ne never disappear. Well, COVID kind of expedited that. You know, people are pretty much paperless. But I think technology in the next five years is gonna change this industry again. The staff that you see today won't exist. And here's what I mean by that. Technology will definitely take over underwriting. You, that position will be gone. It'll go right from a fact finder right through. Money in motion, meaning that the investment paperwork, all the things that you see them doing now, that person will disappear. Technology will take it over. I'll even predict that the case prep, the intellectual, I have to plan this, will disappear. Meaning that technology programs will take it over. The advisor could massage it. So I want them to think if this all disappears, what does their team look like? And then a lot of advisors get excited and say, oh, that's exciting, Andrea, because I'll save 40% because 40% goes to expenses. That'll come back to me. I'll say, well, no, don't be so quick. Think about this. If it's just you, how many clients can you handle? And then they pause. I'll say, so let's say you have three, 400 clients. It's just you. Can you go away on vacation? They can. 
So at night, you're going to answer all the sophisticated questions. Are you going to be the think tank for everything? See, I think that's the old, what do you call egocentric model. Here's the new model. That they have this team. That's a brilliant think tank. So they have someone that maybe specializes in business planning. Someone specializes in taxes. These persons in the meantime will be doing the hybrid roles until those roles disappear. But here's the other piece. I questioned, I said, why can't team members prospect? So for example, we know right now in the industry that husband and wife, husband dies, woman inherits the money. Around 76% of women are gonna fire their husband's advisors. Gone. We also know in the industry right now that millennials, when their parents die and they inherit the money, about 80% of them are gonna fire their parents' advisors. So the industry needs to ask this, it's this question, what can we change about the experience that their clients are having with them that keeps the women and keeps the millennials? And to me, Nancy, this is where we create what I call a raving fans experience, and that's in your team. So what happens if a team member for example, could educate women on money. Why if she could educate women on money to the clients and then invite prospects in and then invite these women in to meet with them? Now she's prospecting. She's not selling, she's prospecting. What if we get someone, for example, in special needs, they're brilliant on seminar selling and they meet with special needs families every month. This is a team member just doing a seminar and then inviting those families in to meet with the advisor and the team. She's prospecting. So I've begun to create what I'm calling the prospecting team. I've taken all the various roles and said, why can't team members prospect and add value? It's a game changer. It's I can changer. absolutely see that. And I can see you, this whole theme of changing the game and improving the game so that advisors and reps can have better lives and better businesses that run by themselves is something that is the through line to everything that you do. And so as we wrap this up, I just want to say, I'm so honored that I got a chance to talk to you about this. And what I heard today about the four pillars, we have to have vision, we have to have an A team, we have to have systems, we have to have leadership. And then that fifth pillar, if I could add one is like, we have to have an eye or the future so that we can create this kind of team that can allow the business to thrive no matter what the future might hold and the future holds a great deal. Remind us again, where can we go and run and not walk to get the free gifts that relate to hiring an A-team and also uh, make, systematizing our case notes? Where do we go for that? So you can go to andreabullard.com forward slash free and just go on there and you'll download these documents. Beautiful. And then you also mentioned that there was the private coaching and the mastermind. And I'm imagining that there are financial advisors and reps that have enjoyed the stories you've told so much and the way that you told them that they know that you are their person. What is the single next best step they can take to move in your direction so that you guys can have that conversation that could turn into these brilliant outcomes for them? Yeah, I really invite people if they think, wow, I'm really interested um, and they want to find out from me where they may be stuck or how they could get unstuck, go on my website, which is andreabullard.com and schedule, you know, a business strategy session with me. It's free. And I know a lot of times, and I, I feel that way too. I don't want to be sold. I don't, I don't sell people. I really like to get to know people, really find out what they're doing. And at that point, no I can, I've been doing this long enough to know what, what is their next step? What's stopping them from taking that next step and really advise them. And sometimes I invite them in say, this is the best strategy. And sometimes I may not be the best person for them, Nancy. And I might say, you need this help over here. So it's really helping them. It's really helping them with their stuck and their blind spots, what they need to do next. And they can also get the book, which is right on my website. They can read that. It's got all details. The new, new guide that says, oh, I'm starting. Where do I go? I have the book. It walks you through AZ, how to build this. Well, all wonderful options. AndreaBullard.com, B-U-L-L-A-R-D.com. 
what a pleasure to get a chance to talk with you today. And I know that the financial advisors and reps who have an opportunity to view this are going to say, wow, I just met someone who could actually be a problem solver to help unlock the life that I want and the business that I've been envisioning from the start. So what a pleasure to be with you today. And thank you so much for joining. And I look forward to bringing you the next Learn More, Earn More interview coming soon so that you can get value from every call that, that, that I lead. If you've loved this, go ahead and subscribe and be sure to look at the show notes to see next steps you can take because those next steps, steps could be game changers for you. Andrea, thank you so much and bye-bye for now. Nancy, thank you as well. Take care. Bye.